Sizzling on Thursday. Uh, Pop up next week after the morning worship. Uh, Mark Castanelli will be the teacher on Wednesday, the 20th. Uh, Mark Vaughn will have the Bible class and the DM service on the 24th. And again, a congregational meeting. It's, it's just to uh, inform you and, and take any questions you might have. And, let you know where we stand on things and what's going on. And if there's any more on that. All right, Tyler will be leading the sounds. I'm going to him. Number 13. 13. There is rest, sweet rest at the Master's feet. There is favor now at the mercy seat. For atoning blood has been sprinkled there. There is always a blessing, a blessing in prayer. There is a blessing in prayer. There is grace to help in our 
so thankful for this day, Father, for another opportunity to come together to worship you, Father, to praise you, to give thanks for all that we receive from your hand. Father, we pray that you would be with us at this hour, Father, that you would uh, help us to have a stronger faith, Father, to trust in you and to wait on you. Pray, Father, that you would help us to face uh, the trials and tribulations that we face with courage, Knowing, Father, that you love us and, and that uh, all good things work together to the good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we pray your blessings upon your church the world over, that you would give each of us, Father, a, a spirit to work, that you would uh, fill us, Father, with your wisdom and understanding, that we might be able to uh, speak in a, in a way that, that will enable us to to convince those around us, Father, that uh, that do not know you, Father, of the great love that you have for them and, and help them to understand your truth. Father, we pray for all men everywhere. Pray that you heal the sick, that you would deliver the oppressed and the afflicted. And pray, Father, that you be with all those in seats of authority. Bless them and guide them that they might keep their charge. Deliver us, Father, from evil in every high place. Help us this hour, Father. All these things we pray through Christ in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> My throat is reminding me that I'm not a tenor, and I was going way too high on that song. 545, this world is not my own. 545. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be like home in this world anymore. Oh, you know, I Heavens 
Shadow 
Judges chapter 6, we'll begin there in just a moment. We'll be looking at see, some Old Testament heroes for a few moments tonight. When I made this lesson, I, I thought I could get through all of the six people that are mentioned in Hebrews 11 th verse 32. And the more I thought of it, the more I probably will have to divide this up into two weeks because there's so much information there. So we're going to, um, it covers a, a good portion of Judges and a couple chapters from First and Second Samuel. So we probably won't work our way into uh, First and Second Samuel this week, probably next Sunday night, but we'll be definitely looking at some of the names we see in Judges. So the Old Testament heroes are represented in three groupings, beginning in verse 32, of uh, the text was read a few moments ago. The first group of names, uh, what we would call those triumphant heroes, if you will, who won military victories or were delivered from serious dangers. And without Christ's church, uh, none of these could be made perfect. So victory was and is achieved through Christ. Uh, our Lord for them and for us. You might say, well, Christ in, in their minds wasn't thought of back then. Well, we know that the blood of Christ really flows both ways. So when we talk about faith, um, it really comes through times of old. And that was what the Hebrew writer was really uh, trying to, to get. Now, what we'll see in these people that we're going to talk about tonight is that many of them were very, very far from perfect. Um, for a matter of fact, once we look at some of the judges, we'll see that some of the judges were very far from perfect. But they are, God finds the good in people, no matter who you are, and seems to be able to use the good that's in somebody. And, and for example, we might find somebody, uh, Fred Flintstone, we might say, well, Fred is an awful character, he's a horrible person. What could good could find in that person? What, you know, but God seems to have the ability to find if there's one good quality, God can find it. And God can use that good quality for uh, the good of, of his kingdom. And certainly he did with some of these people as, as we look at them. Um, so we see in verse 32, as was read, a few names of heroes. For a matter of fact, there's six names of heroes. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of, and here they are, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jep uh, Jephrath, and David, Sago, and the prophets. So we have these names of people in the, the godly conquest or conquested kingdoms, uh, whereas we assume for implication was that the unrighteous were defeated and destroyed. Great lessons are found in each of the episodes from Hebrew history represented here. And the Bible is filled with wonderful examples of faith. So many, in fact, that the author could not make use of them all that were available to him and nor did he need to. So what follows is this list of names and deeds that would have been known to every recipient of the letter. So if you would receive the Hebrew letter, if you're the audience that the letter, the original letter was intended for, you would understand who these people are and what they did. Now, some of these names may seem very familiar to some of us, and we might think of them and, and, and know exactly what they have done or, or you know, their good and bad 
or characteristics. So we'll look at some of them uh, tonight as we get into our scripture. Now, I want to talk about the judges for just a second. There's 410 years, 410 years that judges were in effect. And when we think of the judges, the period of judges was really a, a time of chaos and turmoil. And after Joshua had died, the next generation of Israelites had no certain leader to lead them. In Judges 1 and verse 1, that you would see that. And so, you know, you have Moses, and Moses was leading the children of Israel. And, and, and you know, as, as individuals, you look to a leader. And so they could look to Moses, and, and as he led them. And then, you know, after Moses died, Joshua took over right away, so there was no... Um, time that there wasn't a leader there. And, and so you can see Joshua's leading right away. And Joshua 1 chapter, or Joshua chapter 1 tells Joshua, be strong, courageous, do not be afraid, lead your people. And so we have him for, for many years leading them into the promised land as they were promised. Well, after Joshua died, there was really nothing there set up for anybody to really to take over like uh, Moses had planned for Joshua to take over. So it was the Lord's desire that they uh, revere him as their king. In other words, as God as their king. In 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, So instead the people of Israel forsook the Lord and worshipped false gods of the Canaanites. So it didn't take long after Joshua died for them to go back into idolatry. Back into idolatrous worship. So they're already doing what God has not wanted them to do. Now because of this, he did not help the Israelites defeat their enemies, but rather he allowed these other nations to oppress them severely. In other words, because they were disobedient, now we're not into the divided nations or anything like that. Now we're at the very beginning, basically, because they were becoming disobedient and going into Canaanite worship and worshiping other gods, God let other people take advantage of them. In other words, punish them for their behavior at this time. And so periodically, when Israel cried out to him, every now and then they would cry out to God, God, we need help, he would he send them a judge to rule over them. The total period of this judges is 410 years. Now, after judges, they you can see that the Israelites were going farther and farther away. Now, the first judge that you have in the judge time period is, um, we would call it the Book of Deliverance, by the way, is another name for it chapters 3 through chapter 16, is Othniel. Othniel was the first judge. Now, he would be your ideal judge, Othniel. Um, he is exactly what God has promised, exactly what God would want to have. As you go through the judges, you're on a downward uh, trip down the mountain, so to speak. So he's the best judge you're going to have. So as you go through the time period and the different judges that they have, they seem to, you know, and uh, we'll see in just a moment that uh, Gideon, which we're going to be talking about in a second, he is the middle judge. Now these judges that we're looking at, the Hebrew writer does not put them from A to B to C to D. He mixes up the order, so we'll start, we'll go through the order pretty much the way the Hebrew writer uh, puts them in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And, and so when we see this judge here, um, you know, he's the middle judge, so he is not as godly as the first judge would be, and a little more godly than the last judge would be. And, and so you, you see at this time period, now don't be confused with, with, with the judge at the very end, Samuel. Samuel is a judge slash prophet, and so he's a little bit different. For, for a matter of fact, some people would not even call him a judge, just call him a prophet. So be careful with him because he is a godly man. And so we can't necessarily put him on his downward slope um, in this prophecy. And, and so when we look at a little bit of these judges, we see that, you know, Gideon, that our first person we'll be talking about, is found at the middle point of these judges. It's included that he's a pivotal character um, in this downward spiral. And it's shown... Uh, moments of faithfulness and so this God takes the moments of faithfulness in a person and shows those and highlights those 
and then used to deliver Israel from the Midianites. However, he not only questioned God, obviously he did things that God didn't like, he asked for signs, but he followed his victory. He also made an ephod, which led Israel back into idolatry. And so while he did good things, he also did bad things. Remember, he's what we call about the middle of the, of the path judge. And so he's not the best judge, and he's not the worst judge. So as you see uh, Israel running down this key slope, you will, of, of judges, um, we have to kind of understand that. So when we look at Israel, excuse me, uh, Judges chapter 6, uh, beginning at verse 12, we, we notice a few things. Beginning at verse 12, Judges chapter 6. Now the first person we have is Gideon. Some of the scriptures I will have the passage on the screen, uh, and some I will not. Um, but I'll tell you what the passage is, it's easy to turn to the next page. Um, the angel of the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? He begins to question God here, doesn't he? Why has all this happened to us? Now you might say, well, that's not a bad question to ask because we have things sometimes that happen in our life and we say, well, why did this happen? And why did that happen? And why do I have to go through this situation? And why do I have to go through that situation? And why couldn't everything just go my way? Well, it just sometimes happens like that. I was downstairs, I told Karen earlier, I was downstairs making some lemonade and I, I removed the cap of the water and I, and I put the powder in there and I put the cap back on and I shook the lemonade and went everywhere. Well, obviously, the little cap of the wall didn't go back on exactly straight. And I said, why did that have to happen? Why do things happen that we don't want to have happen? And so he asked God this question. And, and, and then he asked another, and where were all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us in the hand of Midian. In other words, you know, our forefathers had talked about all the wonderful things that God did for us. Where are all those wonderful things? Right now, it seems like God has forsaken us. Now, this is the man that God is going to send into battle for his people. And he seems to have some questions for God. Notice how God reacts to the situation. The Lord God turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. Isn't that interesting? God doesn't start apologizing or saying, Well, well, listen, this happened or, or that happened. He gives a command. Here's your task. In other words, it's almost a military situation, isn't it? You know, if you're a soldier and a soldier under you begins to question you, and you're a colonel or something like that, and, and you ignore their questions and you give them the direct command, you go do this. And that soldier should do what? Go and do what they're told to do, really, without question. God says, you go, you save, you save Israel, you save my people. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I'll be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you and who speaks that it is you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my presence and set it before you. And he said, I will stay. 
until you return. So at this point, Gideon doesn't seem strong, does he? He doesn't seem all that faithful. We would look at him and just say, well, he doesn't seem faithful. But I've always said, if you hang around somebody who has the right attitude long enough, that attitude is going to come upon you. And certainly, if we turn over to chapter 7, we begin to see that. Chapter 7, verse 1, then uh, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped besides the spring of Herod. So you can picture the, the spring of Herod and the and beautiful spring there where you would get water and, and, and it would dry your thirst and, and all those things. And, and, and so they camped by this spring. And, and the camp of the Midianites was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel boast over saying, my own hand has saved me. Now I want you to notice this. God is saying, listen, your army is just too big. If I send your army in there, you're going to defeat them. And then you're going to take the credit for it. And the people are going to take the credit for it. And I don't want that. So we're going to have to take this decent sized army that you have and whittle it down. Now normally, a military person would say what? The more, the bigger the army, the, the better. That's not what God's saying. God's saying, listen, you're going to have to have a little faith, Gideon. It's going to be all about faith. And remember, he said, you're going to fight this battle as one man. And, and so we notice as he begins the process here, verse 3, now, therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Well, that's a good way to get rid of them, isn't it? Y'all too scared to be here? Y'all don't want to go to battle? Yeah. Go home. Really? Go home. Okay. 22,000 of them went home. Now you got what? 10,000 tough guys that aren't afraid. Well, that seems still too many. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them <clears throat> down to the water. I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, thus this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone who I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord God said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink, the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give you the Midians into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So it was a test. 10,000 men go down for the test. You can lap the water like a dog or you can kneel down and pick the water up. Most of the people, 9,700 people kneel down to get their water. There's 300 remain. And so this is the number. Now, if we were planning this, we would have gone out with the 32,000 people that were originally in the army and said, okay, let's go, we're going to need everybody. Here we go. We're on our post. We need everybody. We need to go. But we have to put what? Faith in God. 
And God says, listen, we need to take this number down and down and down. And finally, we get just a few people here. Now you know that is because of God and will give the glory to God. Verse 8, so the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. They sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent. But retained the 300 men at the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp of Purah, your servant. And you shall hear what they say. And afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then they went down with Purah, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the uh, Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand in the, is in the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, the man was telling a dream to his comrade. So you see, I find it interesting because he says, listen, he never asked Gideon, are you afraid? He said, Gideon, you ask these men if they're afraid. Now he asks Gideon, listen, if you're afraid, you need what? Some encouragement. You go down here and you get this encouragement. See, if we look at our faith, no matter how strong our faith is as Christians, sometimes we need encouragement. And certainly Gideon did here. When we look down to Judges chapter 6 and verse 7, So Gideon, the fifth judge, who by faith defeated the Mennonites, Gideon's army was only 300 men and vastly outnumbered, facing 135,000 men by faith. Now, once again, we see that Gideon later on did things that he shouldn't have done. But when we look at every single person in the Bible, it seems like that's the case. And that's why we can only say there's one perfect, that's Jesus Christ. Because people have good days and, and seemingly have bad days. Now, when we move on to our, our next person, we see Barak and, and his 10,000 men in Judges chapter 4. So we're going to reverse order back here. We're going to a judge that Barak, uh, Deborah is the judge at the time, Deborah and Barak. And they're going to kind of work together. Um, you see in verse 4, uh, chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So Ehud was the king before. And they did have this process. Remember, they're going downhill. After a judge would die, it wouldn't be immediately appointed another judge. There would be a little bit of a time period before the next judge would be appointed. So in that interim period between judges, there was always problems. People thought they were in kind of in charge of themselves. And then you have that phrase, they did what was right in their own eyes, which seems to be never a good thing uh, throughout the Bible. Every time you see that phrase in the book of Judges or elsewhere, um, it's always someone going in, in the wrong direction. So you have that. So Barak and his 10,000 men defeated the Canaanites who had 900 iron chariots and an army much larger than Israel. So we see that in verse 1. And the Lord said to them in the, uh, so, excuse me, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who resigned in Hazar, the commander of his army was Sisra, who lived in uh, Harishrath, uh, Hygama, how do you say that? The, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Remember, that's every time they cry out to the Lord. So if they lose a king, 
There's an interim period where there's no king. They cry, they go down in status. They cry to God for help. God, send us a judge. Send us a judge. And, and so you have, God sends them a, a judge to help. So the people of Israel cried out in verse 3. And here's the problem. They had 900 chariots of iron, as I mentioned. He oppressed the people of Israel cruelty for 20 years. Well, sounds a little bit like the bondage in Egypt, doesn't it? Now, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of the Le, Lepethoth, was a judge in Israel at that time, and she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summons Barak, the son of Abinam, from Kadesh, uh, Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded you to go gather your men at Mount Tabar, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? I will draw out uh, Cyrus, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kadesh, or Kishon with the chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hands. You see, the, the judge seemed to have that power with God to give people into their hands, and so I will give them into your hands. So Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. But we can ask the question, well, why did Barak want Deborah to go with him? Because he saw the power of God that she represented. And so he's looking for that power of God that she represented. Verse 9, and she said, I'll surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sarah into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went on at his heels, and Deborah went on with him. So Barak's desire to have Deborah along for the battle surely indicates that he had faith in God who directed her, but his faith was not as strong as it might have been. Though he would not receive honor for the victory, he still led the army into battle for the glory of God in Israel. Well, we'll cover one more quickly tonight, and one of my favorites is Samson. Samson is the 13th judge. Maybe you recognize Samson because Samson was the one that had uh, hair, if you will. Uh, long hair. We see in Judges chapter 13, verse 24, and a woman bore a son and called him his name Samson. The young man grew up and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in uh, Manana Dan between Zorah and Estol. And so you have this young man and his name's Samson. He's dedicated to the Lord by his mother. Judges 14 in verses 1 through 4, we continue to, to, to look at him a little bit. And we see Samson went down to Timnah, and Timnah, at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. And this is interesting. Now get her for me as my wife. Now, I was a young man and I never thought of going to my parents as I saw this young lady, get her for me as my wife. I guess this is a little more custom than anything, but uh, you know, Samson belonged to his parents technically at this point. And, and so, you know, and, and a lot of times they had arranged marriages in these days. But look what his parents said. His father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you may go and take a wife from the un 
circumcised Philistines. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. Look at this. For she is right in my eyes. Now remember the phrases that have been used. The people did what? What was right in their own eyes. I wonder if that happens today. Do we live in a world where people do what's right, not necessarily according to God's word, not necessarily according to the Bible, but what's right in their own thoughts and their own eyes? Isn't that the case? Samson said, look, the woman, obviously she must have been attractive. She's among the Philistines, and she, they, she this, this relationship is destined for trouble, destruction. It, it shouldn't happen. It's a inner marriage, and, and at that time, if, if you're, you know, this shouldn't have happened at all. You have a person of Israel, and you have uh, a, someone who's like married out of the family of God, so to speak, and this, this just should have never happened. And so certainly you see that here. Um, so his father, verse 4, and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So we go over to chapter 16, and notice chapter 16. Then Delilah, oh, the name just sounds scary, doesn't it? Mr. and Mrs. Samson, we want you to meet Delilah. You know, if, if my son brought a Delilah home, I'd say, oh boy, this sounds like trouble. Here's Delilah and Samson. Now until now, you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how your might, you might be bound. And he said there, if you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak like other men. Remember, he had long hair. And she wanted to know where his strength lies. Basically, so she could do him no good. And, and so he gives her a, a few different ways to do it. And, and, and so while he slept, the lion took the seven locks of his head and, and wove them into a web. And she made them tight with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke from his sleep and pulled away the pen and threw him in the web. We remember that finally he told her the secret. Well, if you get an Elvis haircut, that takes away your power. If you cut your hair, that takes away your power. And so certainly she did that. She meant no good for him. But Samson was a sinner. He did not, he's not praised for his sins, but the author of Hebrews, Samson's greatest weakness was being enamorated with a godless woman. He's not the first person to do that, or that will be the last person. He was blessed with renewed strength but he lost his own life when the Philistines killed him. His faith in God enabled him to perform a final demonstration of power. We don't have time for any more tonight, and we'll finish those next week. We think of the faith that these men had. They had faith, but they had struggles. We think many times they're not much different than you and I, are they? We have faith, sometimes we have struggles. Sometimes we need to cry out to God for strength and we need to go to God in prayer for strength and we need to correct the problems that we have in our lives and get back on the path that we should be on. We offer an opportunity at the conclusion of every service for people to become a Christian or to have prayers and, and, and help in any way we can. Tonight we offer the opportunity to stand as we stand. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hark in the loving call away. Come for ye loves you so. Oh,
Lord's Supper has been left prepared for those who were unable to surround the table this morning. <coughs> Christ set forth this memorial so that we might always remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Let's take that opportunity now. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your Son, Jesus. For the sacrifice was made on Calvary's cross on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents his body. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of it, we would be pleasing in your sight. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, we thank you also for this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. That washes away our sins and gives us the hope of eternal life with you in heaven. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of it, it will be in a manner pleasing to you. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So that concludes the Lord's Supper. Um, is there anything else that needs to be announced? Uh, Tim, who was just here this morning, I just learned that apparently it's girlfriend uh, Amelia Hartzog has a cyst growing on her hip and she's in the hospital. I can't remember if she's in the hospital or not, but she's going to get looked at and we're trying to figure out how fast it's growing. It's causing her a lot of pain. Huh? It's causing her a lot of pain. I just got a picture in from uh, Christina. Uh, she's tested positive for COVID. Okay. Um, Christina Robinson has tested positive for COVID. Um, We're down in Florida. Friend of Tyler's, Amelia, well, <laughs> a friend of Tyler's friend, Amelia Hartzog, has a cyst that's causing her a lot of pain. Please remember her prayer. Joyce. Um, there's several families from the Pentecostal Church. for another good lesson from God's Word. We certainly hope to see everyone back on Sunday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Bible study. I'll be getting ready to skip a whole week. <clears throat> certainly want to see everyone back for Wednesday evening Bible study. If you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer. We'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you've given us to surround your throne and sing praises to your name and to hear a portion of your word presented to us. Father, we pray that the things said and done here pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that you will be with those that we mentioned that are sick and suffering. It will be your will that they might soon regain their health and be able to be with us once again. Watch over us, Father, as we leave here. Give us safe passage to our destinations. Help us, Father, to always be mindful of your word as we go about our lives. Help us, Father, to, to make the proper decisions and to flee from the temptations the Satan places before us. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray.